But welcome, welcome. Uh, the only announcement I have this morning um, is uh, that next week, as you may recall, I have invited uh, Daniel Krim, uh, the missionary to Turkey, um, and um, his family to come and be with us. And I'm going to give him a few minutes at the beginning of our worship service to tell you about his missionary work in Turkey. And I am going to ask for uh, some donations if you feel so inclined. And you can make those checks out or that cash out. It doesn't make any difference. Give them to David Baker and he will give me one check and it will be in my name uh, because the way that you donate to his mission work is uh, through his mission organization. And I have that set up so that I can put it on my credit card or take it out of my bank account, one or the other. And whatever amount of money we collect for his mission, um, I will send that in the name of Bethel Cumberland Presbyterian Church in addition to the money that I will be sending for myself. Uh, the flowers this morning on the altar are beautiful as usual, a beautiful vase. And they are uh, given by Barbara Salinas in uh, honor and in memory of her mother on her birthday. So thank you very much, Barbara. And uh, we wish your mother, of course, a uh, uh, happy birthday. At this time, I would like to have our prayer of invocation so that we may move into our time of reverence before God and worship him properly. Let us pray together. Mighty God, we stand before you today recognizing that we are your children, that we and all that we own is due to your blessings upon our lives. We know that without you in our lives, we are without a guide, we are unworthy, we are basically just lost children. And so we glory in your presence in our lives. The reaching out of the Holy Spirit in our lives, the presence of Jesus Christ, his teachings that we can go to at any time and enrich our lives and enlighten our spirits. For all that, Heavenly Father, we are so grateful. Please be with those that cannot be with us this morning and give them a blessing also. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Our opening hymn this morning is number 150, uh, Are You Washed in the Blood? Let's stand and sing together, please. <laughs>
I'm going to put on my glasses and look at that number one more time. Oh, it's 190. <laughs> well, I left myself in the dust on that one because I went to 150 and I said, okay, let me get closer to that and see it. <sighs> Thank goodness you guys are sharp and you're on top of it, keeping me straight. Our offertory sentence today comes from Ephesians, and we invite you at the closing of our worship service this morning, since we're not passing the plates, to come forward as you leave the sanctuary and make your offering to God here on his altar. And our offertory sentence today, because of his great love for us, our God, who is rich in mercy, has made us eternally alive through Jesus the Christ, even though we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved, raised up, and seated with Jesus in the heavenly realms. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of faith, you may remain seated, uh, is number 529. Oh, how I love Jesus. Let's sing together. have several prayer cards to share this morning. Uh, Michael Bracey, Nina reminds us, who has cancer, uh, has indicated that it has spread considerably and uh, we need to uh, increase and continue our prayers for Michael Bracey. Bill Herndon, a long time friend of mine from the downtown church, Harold reminds us he's on daily dialysis and not doing particularly well at this time. He was just, uh, 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 just a real wonderful man, and, and I am sorry that he's having to deal with this on a daily basis, and we will certainly uh, keep uh, Bill in our prayers. And uh, I have a note here, I, I assume it's from uh, Michael and, and Jennifer that... Uh, both Noel's brother and father are going to have heart surgery. They, just, they both had just had it. Oh, they just had it. Yeah. One had Bill Price had a triple bypass, and B.J. Price uh, just had heart surgery. So, yeah, yeah, oh, my goodness. Issue. Okay. Well, I appreciate you sharing that with us. I had no idea. Uh, that is, uh, that's a lot for one family to bear with. <laughs> Yes, Susan. Um, I just want to say that I'm so glad that you're 
just wanted to let everyone know that uh, Connie's husband Fred had an affordable and he is doing great. Wonderful, wonderful. Appreciate you letting us know about that. Anyone else? Jennifer. Yes, Miss Nina. Jennifer is well enough to be with us. Amen. Absolutely. It's good to see Jennifer here. I like her to be here just to keep Michael under control, but I'm also happy to see her just because she's here. Wonderful. Uh, I'm yes, ma'am. Continue to keep uh, Chris Davis and Tiffany in Okay, absolutely. Yes, Beverly. Absolutely. That's tough on everyone when it comes to that point. We certainly understand. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Lord, we are so susceptible to the emotional pangs of someone in our family that is very sick and not doing well. It is difficult for us to relate and to understand and to get our minds around the pain that some people are enduring, the trauma that they are going through in their lives. And I don't just mention this, Lord, from the vein of medical attention. We have people that we know and we love that are also going through relational and financial, financial and personal distress. We know that you and your son Jesus are the answer to that pain that we feel. That you will be there with us and guide us and comfort us when we don't know where to go or what the answer is. I speak for everyone right now, Lord, when I say we recognize Jesus as the answer to all of these issues. He will be there with us as we struggle and stumble along, lifting us up, putting us back on our feet, comforting us and cradling us and holding our hand when that is what we need. I ask, Heavenly Father, that the families receive a special blessing from you this morning, in the name of this congregation that prays mightily and loves them much, and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, the administrator of your love and your joy and your sense of peace, bestow it now. In his name, amen. amen. This morning, we'll have our communal prayer together. It is the Lord's Prayer. It's printed in your bulletin, and let us pray as we have been taught from our hearts. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I encourage you at this time to go to your Heavenly Father in a moment of silent prayer. Just you and your Lord.
Amen and amen. We have special music this morning, and you are in for a real treat. I, I heard Stacy practicing this morning, and it is doubly beautiful. We look forward to it. Always hunger for 
Stacey, thank you so much. Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Matthew. You know, I'm doing a four-part series, the journey of Jesus to the cross. And last week, we talked about the four final lessons that he gave to his disciples uh, before he began his final physical walking to Jerusalem. And today we're going to be in chapter 26. Uh, The entire reading is verse 1 through 56. We're going to read 1 through 16. And we will glean from that the understanding of the machinations, the -the behind-the-scene workings of the people as Jesus went to the cross. Chapter 26, Matthew, starting with verse 1. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, the four lessons that he delivered, he said this to his disciples, as you know, the Passover is two days away and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then in the same time frame or the same day, the chief priest and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest whose name was Caiaphas. And they plotted to arrest Jesus and in some sly way to have him killed. But not during the feast, they said, because the people may riot if we do that. While Jesus was in Bethany in this same time frame, in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table during a meal. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Jesus, aware of what they were muttering among themselves about, said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me. For my burial, I tell you the truth, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done here today will also be told in memory of her. And once again, in the same time frame, one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and he asked, What are you willing to give me if I hand Jesus over to you? So they counted out for him 30 silver coins. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to the chief priests. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, our our message, even though I have entitled it machinations, which, you know, that word simply means the the behind-the-scene workings of the people, how they, some people refer to it as the machine. And I still remember a couple decades ago, one of uh, the young people that was working for me, he had a a T-shirt that said uh, he he liked the band called Rage Against the Machine. And, of course, it was one of those loud, head-banging, you know, bands. But the idea was to rage against the machine that 
didn't let him do what he wanted to do when he wanted to do it the way he wanted to do it. So machinations behind the scenes of things that pull and, and form things, make things happen, sometimes good, sometimes not. But I, I brought a couple things with me this morning. Since we're talking about voices, I was going to ask the children if they were here, I was going to set this down in front of them and say, do you know what this is? And see, and see what their response, you know, would be, you know, a hammer of some sort, I don't know. Some of them obviously would know that this is a phone. And I bought this phone years ago uh, when my mother began having trouble with uh, cell phones. It seemed like no matter how she held it, she either turned it off or on or up or down or cleared it or changed the number or something with her with her fingers, so I bought this for her, and she used it for several years to good effect, plus the fact that she could hear voices on that one very easily. With the new phones, you know, sometimes it was up here, sometimes, you know, it was all over the place, and, and she had problem with the voices on the smartphone, the iPhone. But I must tell you that you know, I'm a, I'm a late comer, you know, I, I'm not Mr. Technology, but I am very impressed with the voices that come through this phone. I receive my uh, emails through this phone, those voices. I, I receive texts from people, those voices. And sometimes I get calls from Afghanistan or Spartanburg, North Carolina, or all sorts of stuff that, of course, I don't answer those. But my favorite voice on this phone now is, is someone uh, named Siri. I don't know if you have Siri on your phone or not, but Siri is one of my new best friends because in my car, my, you know, I purchased a car last year, um, all I have to do is say, hey, Siri, uh, make, sure, <laughs> make, make sure she's not listening. Um, all I have to say is, Hey Siri, play me some Beatles music. And on my radio in my car, Beatles music comes on. And no, you can't trick Siri. You know, I can say, hey Siri, I can go back. Play me some Perry Como. She goes, okay, Perry Como. I don't see enough for that. There you go. She's listening. She was listening. Um, <laughs> she's always listening. I even one day went back to when I was in the middle school and uh, that Jerry and the Pacemakers was the band that I lived for and they played great, uh, not crazy rock and roll music and I asked her to play that. Okay, now playing Jerry and the Pacemakers. Hey, she can do it all. So that voice for me is very important. As a matter of fact, I got a message just the other day from Siri that said, if I need to set the alarm on my phone now, she can do that. All I have to do is say, Siri, set the alarm for 3 p.m. Okay, now setting. She never tells me no. She never tells me anything other than, okay, we'll do that. I'm finding that. I love her voice. But this morning, we're going to look at the voices associated with this piece of scripture, verses 1 through 16. And, and really, I'm going to illustrate for you, I hope that the machinations going on as Jesus walked to the cross, and remember, Jesus is not walking to the cross alone. We are walking with Jesus to the cross through these series, this series of messages. This morning, we have the voice of Jesus speaking to us through this scripture. We have voices of insight and understanding of who Jesus is and what's going on. And then we have voices of dissent and betrayal. An overwhelming number of voices of dissent and betrayal. You know, we all have a vision of who Jesus is and the people, these voices that we're going to look at in this scripture, they all have a vision 
of who Jesus is. And that vision is dictating for them the things that they are saying and doing behind the scenes to either raise Jesus up in his message and his ministry or in an attempt to tear it down, a denial, a betrayal. Whatever your vision of Jesus is, it dictates what kind of a voice you will have, a voice of understanding and building Jesus up in his mission or a voice that doesn't understand and is misguided and can deny Jesus and where he is headed. So your voice this morning, we're going to identify also. The first voice we hear in this scripture this morning is Jesus speaking. You know, Matthew writes, after he had said all these things, talking about the four lessons he had just given to his disciples, uh, Jesus once again tells his disciples, we're two days away from Passover and the Son of Man is going to be crucified. Uh, he has said this to them many times in the last few weeks in their relationship because he wants them to grasp and understand what's going on. But guess what? Once again, they do not. Jesus is attempting by these messages and the other messages that we're going to talk about this morning to do what is called centering. If I center myself, if I set myself aside before prayer time, before I light a candle and pray for someone, I center myself by making myself focus on Jesus and his ministry. And that's what Jesus is doing in this scripture. He's asking his disciples to center themselves to focus themselves on what's really going on. In two days, it's Passover. I'm going to be crucified. Center yourself. Don't be distracted by what's going on in the world or what you may feel in your heart that's not true, that's not about what I'm trying to center you around. Focus you on me and my ministry and your place in it. So he tries over and over to center his disciples. That's his voice. He's finished these lessons. He told them in two days it's going to be Passover. And this is particularly for you uh, Bible students, you scholars of the Bible, you know that it is not coincidence that this Lamb of God is going to be given on Passover. We know that Passover originally was established for the Hebrew people and every time they have Passover, they sacrifice a one-year-old or less pure, unblemished lamb to atone for their sins for the past year. That's what Passover does for them. God gave them that gift when they left Egypt. Celebrate this. Every Passover, a sacrificial lamb is given to atone for your sins. So here is Jesus saying, on Passover, I am going to be given over and I am going to be crucified. In other words, through our minds, we now know that what he was saying was, I am going to take the place of that real lamb and I, as the Lamb of God, am giving myself over to you, clean and unblemished, so that I will become the sacrificial Lamb of all time for all people, the sacrificial Lamb of God. You see how all this works out? It's amazing sometimes when you know these facts, how God made this work. It doesn't just fit. It fits perfectly. So he's trying to make them understand, here I am, God's lamb, giving myself over for you and for everyone. The son of man, and note this, he uses these words. This is the proper translation. I will be handed over. Not taken 
against my will, I will be handed over. And who is handing over his son? It's our heavenly father is handing over his son to the chief priest and the high priest and the elders and the Romans and everybody else that is centered on his demise. Handed over, extremely important words. Jesus is handing himself over. His father in heaven is handing him over. They're getting out of the way and they're letting all of the machinations work so that he will be the sacrificial lamb and he will be crucified at that time. <clears throat> well, in verses 3 through 5, we hear some other voices of machinations. Uh, Matthew says, the high priest, the um, chief priest, and the elders, that means the elders of the tribes, of each tribe, they gathered together in the palace of the chief priest. Now, this right here is disturbing if you understand the history of the Hebrew people. I, thought, I read this and I thought, well, where in um, the law or where in the instructions from God did it say that your chief priest is supposed to live in a palace somewhere? I don't think that's really there. I don't think that's part of the deal. But it's the humanization of the law of God and that the chief priest thinks, well, he needs a palace too. But they're meeting there. And what does Matthew say that they're doing? Listen to the words that he uses. They were plotting to kill him slyly, but not upset the people in the process of doing that. You see, Jesus had connected with the people. The people, many of the people, they love Jesus. They see him for who he is. He feeds them, he heals them, he teaches them, he enlightens them, he lifts them up, he makes them feel good about who they are and who their God is. And so the chief priest says, now we're going to plot and we're going to slightly have him killed, but we're not going to do it during the Passover because that might upset the people and the people would take that out on us. So they want to kill Jesus, but they want to protect themselves. So these are true voices of negative or uh, machinations or uh, divisive or certainly ungodly, not part of you know, the feeling of understanding who Jesus is. They, they saw Jesus as an enemy, someone who was challenging their understanding. And so they said, we're going to plot. We're going to get this taken care of. We're going to kill this guy. And I'd say he was just a guy to them. Maybe a prophet, but he wasn't working in their vein and they wanted him gone. And then in verses 6 and 7, you have, you have this insertion of a woman. Now this story is told in more than just this gospel and it, it's tweaked a little bit. Some of the other gospels are just a little bit different. And she doesn't speak with her voice. She speaks with her actions. And while Jesus is reclining, and I've explained this to you before, you know, they actually reclined at the table uh, with their head toward the table and their feet, you know, out. And while he was there in this house with these people, she came in, never said a word, and poured on his head expensive perfume. Now, we need to look at this and understand what this means. It's just like the word Passover and lamb being important. This also is important because when you pour oil on somebody's head at that time, who was anointed with oil? King David was anointed with oil by the God, the command of God. Well, here we have Jesus Christ who is, as we know, the king of all things, at the end of the book of Matthew, he declares, I have been given authority over all things by my heavenly father. Well, this is God. God has directed this woman. Where did this woman come from? Out of nowhere. She had to have received from the Holy Spirit something in her heart that said, take this expensive perfume and go anoint this prophet. 
Well, this was God's anointing of Jesus as he was crucified and resurrected as the king of all kings, the king of all things. And this woman was God's instrument. And she brought that expensive perfume, she poured it on his head, and she, at the direction of God, obviously anointed Jesus in his kingship. And Jesus, in an attempt, once again, to center the people, responds and says, you know, she did this in preparing me for my death and my burial, which is what they did then. You know, I didn't have embalming. They just kind of coated the body in the best smelling things that they could find and wrapped it up. But he said, it's like she's preparing me for my death and my burial. But in essence, the essence of what happened was the anointing of Jesus Christ as the king of all things. Well, we hear the voices of the disciples speak. You can have, as I said, voices of understanding and insight, or voices of no understanding and no insight. And when we hear the disciples speak, we obviously see that they have no understanding and no insight, because they were showing indignation that she took this expensive perfume and poured it on the head of Jesus, you know? And their declaration is this. Why, well, we could, if it had been my perfume, you know, let me puff out my chest a little bit. <gasps> if it had been my perfume, I would have sold it and given the money to the poor. Well, I wonder if that was true or not true or if they were just trying to impress Jesus. Because, you know, he just recently told them about the sheep and the goats and about taking care of the poor and the prisoners and that sort of stuff. And I think they were just trying to score some points with Jesus. Well, I'm not like this woman. You know, this woman who doesn't understand who you are, your message, your ministry. I would have sold it and given that money to the poor. Well, that was an attempt on their part to raise themselves up in the eyes of Jesus. But Jesus very clearly indicates, once again, trying to center the disciples. Look at what is really going on here. Let me explain this to you. This woman has done, and he uses these exact words, this woman has done a beautiful thing for me. You know, how many people, when we read through the scriptures, did something for Jesus, something beautiful to Jesus. Everywhere I went, people were verbally attacking him and, and, and arguing with him. And, you know, they weren't doing these nice anointments that this woman did. And Jesus said, I've explained to you, I'm not long for this earth. My death and burial is upcoming. What she did was a beautiful thing. And I appreciate it. She seized the moment. Remember I said somehow the Holy Spirit had infused her heart with the knowledge that Jesus was not long for this world. What can you do for him? And this woman took that expensive perfume and did what she could. And Jesus said, well, this was a beautiful thing. She seized her moment to make me feel special, to recognize me as receiving an anointment, becoming the king. It was all part of her plan for Jesus Christ. I know Jesus says, and this is disturbing to many people, he says to his disciples, you will always have the poor with you, but... You will not always have me. You know, you don't need to be offended by that because Jesus is not saying, well, I'm better than the poor. You need to care, take care of me and not take care of the poor. But it, it, it's, he's saying to his disciples, ah, oh, all of a sudden you care about the poor. All of a sudden you want to sell things and give the money to the poor. Well, where were you yesterday or the day before that or the day before that? That's what he's saying. You've always had the poor. Why at this moment is it so important to you to take care of them now? When this woman has done something that is special and beautiful to me. And you see it as an opportunity to raise yourself up and make yourself look big 
in the eyes of other people. Jesus will have none of their self-puffing and self-lifting up. The preparation of Jesus for his death by this woman and the anointing obviously came from God. Jesus obviously thought it was a wonderful and beautiful thing and he gives her a blessing. I want a blessing from Jesus. Everybody wants a blessing from Jesus. And he gives her one right there in front of everybody. Well, you guys are so busy puffing yourselves up and trying to make yourselves look good. I'm going to give a blessing to this woman. From now on, he said, wherever the gospel, the good news is told, this woman will be remembered for what she did to me on this day forever. And he gave her that blessing. It doesn't say that she got up and she left at that point, but my guess is that she had done her part. She had followed God's command. She'd received a blessing from Jesus, the Messiah, and she probably left at that point, her job being done. And then as we continue through this short piece of scripture, 16 verses, we have one final voice. And it's the voice that we all know. It's the voice of Judas. The one who has given over himself to what we could call the dark side. He has given himself over and he went to the chief priest and he says, if I give you Jesus, what will you give me? Now that's the worst part of what Judas did because we know that it was God's plan for his son to be taken, to be handed over, to be crucified, to be resurrected. So, you know, Judas was just kind of in the works, so to speak. But when Judas turned this around, when he turned it around and he said, how can I make this a gain for me and a loss for Jesus Christ? It would have been one thing if he had gone to them and said, I've lost my faith in this prophet Jesus and I'm going to hand him over to you. I'm going to give you the information you need to arrest him. But he turned it around and he said, how can I turn this into a situation where I gain from it? He didn't end up as a, as a neutral position for Judas. He wanted money. He wanted to gain from the demise of Jesus Christ. And that's different from just losing faith in Jesus Christ. It was much worse for him. It was a denial and a betrayal of his Messiah for his benefit. Oh my. Oh my. Well, you know, the rest of this scripture, though, I said we have 56 verses in this section, in chapter 26. And the rest of those 56 verses, it goes back and forth just like it did as I illustrated to you. Jesus attempting to center his people and bring them back to his reality and the people denying, betraying, and turning against him constantly. We look in these 56 verses and we see that the very next section is Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper with his disciples. What was that? That was another attempt by Jesus to center his people. Let me tell you what this is all about. It's about my body and my blood and a new covenant. Center yourself, focus. And he did that for them. But also, there was the prediction of Peter's denial, those other voices of denial and betrayal. There he was at Gethsemane, and you may recall when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, come be with me and and, and just, just be here with me and stay awake while I pray. And, and they couldn't do it. They didn't do it. And then we finally hear the voices in the garden of the mob of the soldiers that belong to the priest, the temple guards. You hear their voices headed toward Gethsemane to arrest Jesus. 
So this is a constant battle that Jesus fights. A battle of trying to center his people and help them to see and their voices of resistance. Well, today, as we, I mentioned earlier, as we, just like Jesus or with Jesus, we're headed to that cross. We're walking toward that cross right now with Jesus. We're on a journey. And we need to decide, are we going to relent? Are we going to submit to Jesus and his attempts to center us around him right now? Or are we going to be voices of excuses, the voices of reasons that I can't do this or do that, or voices of not really understanding who Jesus is and where he's headed. We, we, we're making a choice. And you know, I, I lay that on you and on me a lot to choose. And today, you need to decide where your voice lies in speaking for and to Jesus? Do we speak with a voice of understanding and insight about our Messiah? Or do we speak with a voice of misunderstanding and denial? Jesus is asking you that question today. I know the answer because I know you people. You want to be centered by Jesus. You want to hear his voice helping you to remain centered. And so I have no doubt in my mind that you're in the right place and you're walking today to the cross with Jesus the Messiah. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you provide us ample evidence, ample solutions to the problems, ample evidence of what is good and what is bad, what is right and what is wrong, and how it is to follow your Son, and how easy it can be if we will just allow him to come into our lives and keep us centered on him and his message and his ministry for us. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning, our hymn of invitation, I invite you to come forward if you have felt the need this morning for a laying on of hands or prayer. We're going to sing number 364, My Jesus, I Love Thee. So if you could please stand and follow Craig's direction, we will sing number 364 together.